and uh, similarly to this, like, uh, like we discussed capacitor and, uh, and resistor, we will, uh, inductors have a certain particular function in the circuit. Somehow they relate electrical uh, quantities in the uh, circuit. And uh, what inductors do, um, <coughs> this is a symbol for an inductor and actually it resembles a coil. Uh, because, well, I will not discuss how to make an inductor today because we don't have <coughs> uh, enough background to, underst uh, to understand how it works. Uh, but in the future, I'll do it. Uh, however, uh, well, when we learn what it is supposed to do in a circuit, we will be able to design a circuit and predict what, in, uh, what will happen in a circuit. Uh, so mechanically, uh, an inductor is just a coil of wire. <coughs> Sometimes there is also a core in it. And it has two sides. Um, and potential difference between the two sides is proportional to the rate at which current uh, passing through this element varies. Not the current themselves. Because if, if potential difference was proportional to the current, it would be what? Not capacitor. A resistor. Correct. Here, we have that the potential difference is proportional to the rate at which the current changes. Current has to vary in order to have potential difference across uh, an uh, inductor. And I will... <coughs> uh, and also... Uh, when we will be analyzing circuits, you have to be careful about what you mark on the diagram and how consistent you are. So if we mark current to the right and think about the rate of change in current, then potential difference which we take has to be from uh, the potential corresponding to the tail of the arrow and we have to subtract potential on the side which corresponds to the tail of the arrow. Uh, <coughs> I didn't have to be in principle consistent, uh, this consistent, but I'm making it also consistent with the other elements. Look, look that it's exactly like in a resistor. In a resistor we also take the potential difference between tail and head. Uh, and for all elements I'm trying to do it the same way so that we are not confused. Uh, that proportionality coefficient between potential difference and the rate uh, in, uh, of change in current is called inductance of the inductor and the uh, unit, SI unit uh, of, uh, of inductance is Henry. And Henry means that I mean, an inductor has inductors of one Henry, that if the current varies at a rate one ampere per second, potential difference is going to be one volt. All right, how about if I give you now a puzzle? Uh, let's say that I will take uh, one Henry inductor and uh, connect it well, and maintain potential difference of one volt for a certain period of time. During this period of time, what, what can you say about the current? Figure out what is the value of the current. <coughs> for a second, for example, a one Henry, a one Henry inductor, uh, um, I will apply a potential difference of one volt to a one Henry inductor. Uh, uh, inductor, what will happen with the current? Consult with each other. What will be the value of the current? You may have a discussion now. Why don't you talk to each other? What will happen to the current? Is there anybody who believes that the current will be one ampere in that inductor? Who believes that the current in the inductor it will be one ampere? And if you don't believe that it will be one ampere, you are right. What potential difference is required to keep uh, uh, current in an inductor equal to one ampere? Uh, 
And do you have idea? Yeah, so if current through the inductor, if this current is one ampere and stays as one ampere for a second, what is the potential difference across the inductor? How much? Zero. Zero. Correct. Because if current is one ampere and it's constant, rate of change in current is zero. So potential difference is zero. How is it possible to have potential difference across the inductor? What kind of current do I have to, to run through that inductor? Varying. We have to vary the, uh, the current. And how would we have to vary the current in a one Henry inductor to maintain potential difference of one volt? And so this is one volt. This is one Henry. So how the current should vary? Yet the derivative of the current should be one. What function or what kind of current will have derivative one? It's varying. How? Varying how? Y yes, it will be a straight line. The, the plot is supposed to be a straight line. It's a linear function. So if we have a linear function, if current varies linearly, then the potential difference across the inductor stays constant. Uh, <coughs> okay, now, before I go to the next subject, why don't we uh, re uh, refresh our memory about all uh, electrical elements? Uh, how about here we relate uh, current across an element with the voltage, you know, so current through the element with the voltage across the element for the three elements which we discussed. So it is capacitor, a resistor, and an inductor. Okay, so for a capacitor, how potential difference is related to uh, current? Do we remember what, uh, what how uh, a uh, capacitor is defined. It's an element for which potential difference. Uh, we're saying? Correct. That the potential difference is proportional to the charge. Uh, so Q equals CV. All right, let's now relate it to the current flowing through the capacitor. Uh, how about I mark it that way? Uh, so what would I have to do with this expression? Well, current is equal to the derivative of charge. Uh, so I would a rate at which capacitor is being charged, which means So we see that in a capacitor, current flowing through the capacitor is proportional to the rate at which potential difference uh, across this capacitor varies. Um, <coughs> now, let's take, oh, I can also say that, that potential difference across the capacitor, I mean, inverse this relationship. So if current is, the is proportional to derivative of voltage, how voltage is related to the, to the current? It's proportional to what's inverse relation to derivative? Integral. So, so potential difference across the capacitor is proportional to the integral of current. Let's now take a look at a resistor. In a resistor, potential difference across the resistor is directly proportional to current. And current is proportional directly to potential difference. And finally, for the inductor, we have that uh, potential difference is proportional to the rate of change in 
current flowing through this element. <coughs> uh, let's now also verify our vocabulary. Uh, <coughs> what do we call this uh, quantity here? Capacitance, correct. And this one? Resistance. Can you insert resistance into a circuit? No, you cannot. Resistance is an abstract con concept. There is no way to put it in or out. What can be put in and out? Uh, a what? Resistor. Uh, however, if I want to say that I want to do something, I want to use, uh, f uh, in the phrase, I want to use circuit and resistance. How should I phrase the sentence? If I replace a resistor, what will I, what I, I'm going to do with the resistance? I can change the resistance of the circuit. Yeah, but resistance, capacitance, inductance are all physical quantities. We cannot take them in and out. It's, in, it's a slang uh, phrase uh, and uh, <coughs> until you really become comfortable, I forbid you to use these phrases. You can only change elements. All right. Uh, <coughs> Today I would, like also, uh, I would like to go to the next uh, uh, subject, uh, because so far, although I didn't, and I, I did it on purpose, I did not actually um, uh, indicate that currents in the circuits which we which we analyzed at this uh, up to this point were constant and actually they were not yeah, because for example when we were charging and discharging uh, uh, capacitor the currents were varying um, however now I want specifically to talk about variable electrical quantities and uh, well, and I want to spend a lot of time on a particular type of alternating current, which is referred to as a sinusoidal alternating current. There are two reasons that sinusoidal uh, alternating currents are um, or com uh, understanding uh, them is, uh, is so important. One is that when we make alternating current, and we make alternating current uh, using generators, and in a generator there is a loop of wire which rotates, making that current a sinusoidal current. So his, uh, history actually made uh, sinusoidal current so important because this is how we discovered uh, uh, how to produce it. And, and then when we find out other sources of electricity, we have trouble, or we have to go into trouble how to convert it into sinusoidal current. Because, for example, now we are trying to, to use uh, uh, solar power, for example, to produce electricity. But the problem with solar power is that, or sol solar panels, is that it does not produce all, uh, sinusoidal current. It produces really a constant current. So now in order to use it together with all the other sources which we are having now, we should convert to sinusoidal and synchronize it with the, with the generators. So w one of the reasons is history. <coughs> there is another reason which is a mathematical reason. And uh, uh, it is that uh, any periodic function, uh, or in principle even not, not periodic function, if we think that we extend the period to infinity, can be represented as a, a series of trigonometric functions. Now let's recall what series are in general. Uh, you are aware about certain series, power series, right? You can represent a function in terms of power series. What do we call these series? 
Taylor series, for example, or Maclaurin series. Right. Now, we can select some other functions to represent uh, functions as series. And if we choose trigonometric functions, now those of you who are advanced in math uh, maybe know what do we call these series. Series in which the uh, uh, terms are sine functions and cosine functions. What are they? Well, you haven't heard of that. They are referred to as Fourier series. So in Fourier series, a function can be represented, uh, any function can be represented as a combination of uh, uh, trigonometric functions. Now, <coughs> now, so for example, I mean, if you think about a square wave, Well, with the first approximation, you can take such a function. Now, <coughs> then you can add a function uh, like this. Yes, yeah, so you can see that it subtracts a little, subtracts, I mean, I made it too much, it should be smaller. Sub, uh, subtracts somewhat here and raises this thing up. And the next sinusoidal function will make it smoother and smoother. And if I take sufficient number of those sinusoidal functions, I can, I can recreate <coughs> the square wave uh, function. All right. So for a sinusoidal alternating current, both voltage across an element and the current through the element are sinusoidal functions of time. Now, <coughs> doesn't, it, doesn't it look like uh, I'm redundant here? I'm saying therefore a sinusoidal current, current is a sinusoidal function. Oh, actually, <coughs> uh, well, let me bring you bring a puzzle which or question which a student asked me once, and uh, and it will clarify again wh wh that it, that everything here is all right. The uh, student asked me uh, a student asked me uh, what is more dangerous, current or voltage to a human body? What actually can kill, current or voltage? Well, think for a moment, and we will vote. So who thinks that voltage kills? Who thinks that current kills? Why do you think that current kills? And they, I mean, without voltage. <coughs> now, it is true, current kills. Uh, but now let me ask you, which current kills? The one in amperes? Does current, which is expressed in amperes, kills? Who believes that? Who believes that another current kills? Ah, you have no opinion now. <laughs> it's the other one. Current measure in, measured in amperes, amperes is as harmless as voltage. Voltage is an abstract concept. Current measured in amperes is an abstract concept. An abstract concept cannot do anything. It's the phenomenon current uh, which kills. Yeah, so it's the other current. Yeah, the, the process the moving, the moving charges are going to kill, not the rate at which they move. Uh, also, therefore, also here, a sinusoidal alternating current, also this is AC current. This is the flow of charged particles. Uh, the flow of charged particles. And if it is a sinusoidal flow of charged particles, voltages across elements and uh, 
currents through those elements are going to be sinusoidal functions of time. I mean, it's not exactly true because there are elements, we have elements for which uh, they don't have be really sinusoidal function. We'll, they will maintain per the same period but uh, won't be uh, like in a diode for example current is going to flow only one way so we will have only half of the sinusoidal function. <coughs> the most general form of a sinusoidal function is like that. So here I wrote function for the potential difference. There is a certain number here there is a trigonometric function, a number, variable representing time and a number. You cannot make it more general than that. And <coughs> for sinusoidal alternating current, both quantities have the same form. Not only that they have the same form, but oh, these two numbers are equal. This number in front of T uh, in uh, potential difference and in the current have the same value. Now, I want you to learn the names of all those numbers because all those numbers have a name. Um, the number which is <coughs> in front of the trigonometric function is called the peak value of, uh, of that quantity. So Vm is peak value of the potential difference. I m is the peak value of the current. Um. And if we look at the plot, it is referred to as peak value because, well, the highest value which sine function can assume is 1. So if sine is 1, then potential difference is equal to peak value, or the, phys the quantity is equal to its peak, peak value. So if you, if you look at, uh, at the plot, peak values are the highest values on the plot of the two uh, electrical quantities. The argument of the uh, sinusoidal function is called the phase of that electrical quantity. So omega t plus delta v is the phase of voltage. Omega t plus delta i is the phase of current. Uh, omega uh, is referred to as angular frequency of that current and uh, it is related, I mean, it is referred to as angular frequency because it is proportional to frequency. We just did, we just don't <coughs> want to have a number 2 pi f, 2 pi times frequency, where frequency says how many oscillations occurs in a second. So f is a number of oscillation in a second. It is referred to as frequency. If we multiply this number by 2 pi, principle it also reflects frequency but in order to make a distinction from the frequency which says how many oscillations we have we call it uh, angular frequency and the reason is just convenience so that we don't have 2 pi in the in the formula we have single single number omega in the uh, uh, in that formula but <coughs> well how about how about well think about if uh, why don't we imagine that this number is zero and think that omega is one? Uh, uh, oh no, Let, let's make it one over, uh, or just two pi. Two pi. Think how many seconds does it take for the voltage to, re to, to complete one oscillation? So at instant zero, sine of, z sine of zero would be zero. Right now, after let's say half a second, well, let's make one quarter of a second, we would have sine of pi over two. Sine of pi over two is how much? One, right? So, uh, so the value changes to one, to the highest value. Now, let's take 
uh, half a second. So we will have sine of pi. Sine of pi is how much? Zero. It returned to zero, but it went just up and down back to zero. Let's take now uh, uh, <coughs> three quarters of a second. After three quarters, if I plug in three quarters of a second, I will get minus one. So it will drop below. And when I take one second, it will come back to zero. Right, so in one second, the uh, voltage completed single oscillation. So frequency is one, and angular frequency was two pi. <coughs> All right. Uh, this angular frequency, if you look at the plot, says how, how much time does it take for an electrical quantity to complete an oscillation, which means to return to the same uh, phase. Well, actually, I'm, I was kind of, because phase is, is measured with, with uh, it's a number between uh, 0 and 2 pi. So if it exceeds 2 pi, then uh, uh, we reduce it by 2 pi or all the time. All right, now the, the last number which we have is the, the delta, and the, the delta refers to as initial phase of that electrical quantity. Well, and again, uh, like uh, with initial velocity or initial position, it doesn't much m make much sense. Initial refers to the instance to which we assign time equal zero. So if we plug in time equal zero, <coughs> then phase of that electrical quantity is going to be equal to the uh, initial phase. And initial phase actually says, uh, well, what is, which way is the plot is shifted from a, from a nice sinusoidal function. <coughs> now we can actually even figure out how, how about if we think about uh, the f what is the phase, initial phase of the current, uh, of the voltage, sorry. Is it positive, negative, or zero? Who votes that it's positive? Who thinks that it's negative? Who thinks that it's zero? Actually, it's, posi it's positive. Yeah, at t equals zero, we have already a positive value of sine functions. Yes, so if this term is zero, sine is positive, which means that this number must be already positive, somewhere between zero and pi over two. For the current, initial phase is negative. Yeah, because uh, we have that we, when we plug when we plug in zero, we got a negative value for sine function, which means that the argument of the sine function has to be a negative number. All right. <coughs> now, when we use electricity, we transfer power from one location to another location. And let's analyze now how power is delivered by an alternating current. Uh, and we will make some some steps to look at the, what is important and what is not important. But uh, <coughs> from the theorem which related electrical power with current and voltage, we should remember that pa electrical power delivered to an element is equal to the product of current and potential difference across the element. At the same instance, so power at in delivered at instant t is equal to the current at this instant multiplied by potential difference at this instant. Now, for sinusoidal uh, 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 current, both quantities are sinusoidal functions of time. So I will write down, I mean, uh, I am a peak value of the current times sine of angular frequency times time plus uh, uh, initial phase of the current. This product represents the current. Peak value of the voltage times sine of angular frequency times time plus initial phase of the voltage gives me voltage at instant t. 
Now I will make a, a, a mathematical step, a trigonometrical step, and recognize actually that we can get a sine, product of sine from a, from a sum of cosines. <coughs> so, uh, well, I copied the pr this product over here. And if you, ch if you check the trigonometric identities, you can find out that difference in cosines will, will give two times product of sines of the sums and differences of the angles over here. So I made just a mathematical step, but this step uh, separates a part of a power which is time independent and part of the power which is time dependent. Look at this cosine, I mean this was the, this was the reason of doing it. Because uh, this cosine now is time independent. It's a constant value. So actually this, this part is a constant value. Now here is a <coughs> trigonometric function. Let's now take a look actually how the plot of that power looks like. I mean this is the plot of this uh, of of the product of current and and uh, and voltage. So we see that whenever at least one of the quantities is zero, we get zero. Now whenever they are they have opposite signs, power is negative. Whenever uh, they have the same sign, power is positive. Now remember that we are considering power delivered to the element. So when power is positive, really the element takes that power. When power is negative, it means that the element actually returns uh, electrical power back to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the circuit. All right. And now let's take a look what is what is the sense of this uh, of this quantity think about what is the average value of this of this function well cosine function oscillates up and down above ze around zero so if we wait long long time the average value or think about just one cycle we can think about one cycle in one cycle what is the average power of the uh, of the sine function zero right how about two cycles Zero. Three cycles. Zero. All right. Now, if it is that, then we don't take a complete number of, of cycles that in accuracy get smaller and smaller and smaller. So over a, a sufficiently long uh, period of time, when we have a large number of cycles, then we can ignore that in accuracy and say that the average value of a cosine function is zero. So average value of this function is zero, and the average value, I mean this expression over here, therefore just represents an average value of the uh, power uh, delivered to the element. Uh, all right, so I can write now, if I, if I take a look at this expression, I can write down that uh, average power is one half of a peak value of the current multiplied by peak value of the voltage times cosine of the difference in phase between voltage and current. Uh, this difference is also referred to as the phase angle between voltage and current. All right, and we use letter phi to represent the uh, phase angle. Now, instead of using peak values, uh, we can use a certain identity, a mathematical concept, uh, which is referred to as a root mean square value of a function, and, uh, uh, well, recognizing, what is this noise? A uh, what? Oh, I see. Uh -huh. uh, sorry for it. Uh, all right. Uh, so, 
instead of having peak values for sinusoidal, uh, for sinusoidal currents, we can use another quantity which is referred to as root mean square value of a function. And for sinusoidal functions, the relationship between root mean square value and the peak value is a factor of square root of 2. So uh, instead of having, I can write down peak value of the current divided by square root of 2, that this is root mean square value of the current, and peak value of the voltage divided by square root of 2 is uh, root mean square value of the voltage. And here is the definition of root mean square value. It will be kind of difficult to, to, to comprehend, but I want to exercise, to make a brief exercise so that you comprehend what a root mean square value is. If you really look at that, you should be able, but you have to study this entire expression, which contains a lot of parentheses. Well, so in order to comprehend what a root mean square value of a function, f, is, well, we have to take the function and square it. Then calculate average value of that square and then take square root of it. So if I summarize it, root mean square value of a function is the square root of the average square of the function. I want you to repeat it. Okay, let me say it again. Root mean square value of a function is the square root of the average square of the function. Say it. Were you able to repeat it? Okay, say it. The root mean square of a function is the square root of the average of the squared function. Yes, I accept it. He got it. Yeah, he got it. <coughs> uh, all right. So how about if I draw a function? Oh, I have already a function. This is a nice function. Uh, so let's say that we have a square wave function Now let's say that this is one second and uh, minus one volt plus one volt. Help me now to find uh, the uh, root mean square value of this function. So what should I do first? I should square the function. Very good. All right. So if I square this function in this interval, what am I going to get? One, correct. If I square the function in this uh, interval, what am I going to get? One, all right. And here, one, all right. So the, uh, if I square this function, I will get a constant function one, right? What should I do next? We have to take average of that value. What will be the average of this value? One. Very good. What should I do next? Take square root of it. And what am I going to get? One. So square root of the, of the square wave function between minus one and one will be also one. Let me make it a little bit more complicated now. And how about if we find square, square root of a function like that? So that assumes only value 0 and 1. So what should be my first step? Square it. All right, so if I square this part, I will get 1, right? If I square this one, this over this interval, I will get 0. And actually, you probably notice that then when I calculate average, it is sufficiently sufficient or root mean square value, it is sufficient to do it only for one period. So let's do it just for this one period. So 
if we square it, I will get 1 over here and 0 over there. Uh, so what should be the next step? St we have to find the average value how much it is going to, uh, to be, what will be the average value of this function. One half. I'm not sure actually if we know we, how we calculate it, but I will test it in a moment ago. It is correct. One half is going to be the average, uh, the average uh, value of that square. So what will be the root mean square value of this function? 1 over square root of 2. Now, just to make sure that, that we understand it, uh, how about if I have a different function? That's like that. So for 2 seconds it, it, it is 1, and for 1 second it is 0. Let's find square, root mean square value of this function. So first step is to square the function. And it happens, how about if we make it different now? Let, why don't we make it 2 volts? So when we square, this one will jump to 4, right? This one will stay uh, at 0. Now we have to calculate the uh, average value. And what will be the average value of this function? It has a value 4 for 2 seconds and 0 for 1 second. How much? Nope. Uh, no. Uh, how did you get it? Hold on. Or oh, maybe you are right. How did you get it? Actually, it's not. It isn't. It's, it's not four-thirds. It's eight-thirds. Now, because average, when we calculate average value, you have forgotten how we calculate average value of a function. Uh, because it, you are, you're still trying to calculate average value of two values. When we calculate average value of a function, we have to, in, uh, over a certain uh, peer, uh, interval from A to B, we have to add all, all values of that function and divide by the number of points in the interval. This is what an average value of a function is. All right, so when we integrate this function and, uh, and recognize that actually an integral is the area, corresponds to the area. So when we integrate function 4 from here to here, we will get, we can take this 4 in front. So we'll have 4 times 2. So it's going to be 8 from here to here. Now integral from here to here will give me 0 because our A has to be here, B has to be there. Right, so, so we'll get 8. And then from here to here is 3, so, so the average value is going to be 8 over, over 3. All right. What would you say? Oh, uh, no, this is, uh, that's great, because this is still not what we are looking for. We have to find a root mean square value, so we have to make, make one more step. What is it? Square root of it. Right, so if we take square root of it, uh, so it will be 2 square roots of 2 over 3. Is it, is it all right now? Great. Uh -huh. um, all right, so I think that this will be all for today.